I'm good. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, um, so Samuel, <clears throat> Samuel is known as Samuel the prophet, even though he um, he was in fact the last of the, of the judges. You know, he again he judges the people, he leads them in war. He's clearly a political leader, um, and, uh, and but but he's known as Samuel the prophet because he was also a prophet, and the bulk of his of his book is about him in his role as a prophet, meaning um, as a spiritual leader, as as a as a man of God who speaks the word of God under a king. Okay, and often against that king, uh, like, like all the prophets that will come afterwards in the Book of Kings and in the twelve, uh, the, the the twelve books of, of, of the prophets later on. Um, in any case, so when when Saul took the throne as king, Samuel ceased to be a judge, ceased to be a political leader. He no longer ruled them. Uh, or judge them or led them in war because now the king performed those duties and Samuel, Samuel from this point on operates as a prophet just as a as a man of God as a spiritual authority um, okay so last week and th this is with regard, with regard to that common refrain at the ed end of the book of Judges that Back in those days, there was no king, and each person did, did as, he, as he pleased. Um, so, I, I, last week I, I, I wrote to you that this common refrain, um, we're, we're told that this common refrain is the author's indictment of the era of the judges. Okay? That, the, that it's a, an indication from the author of the book that the rule of judges was not sufficient to keep the Israelites, um, you know, to keep the people from doing wicked acts like the wickedness that we see in those two last stories, um, and 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 beforehand too. And like like I like we discussed last time or last times, this is all part of the understanding of the book of Judges as a story of spiritual and moral decline. Okay, and, and that it becomes apparent. To the to the biblical author, um, that the rule of judges is no good. Anyone can do what he pleases because there's no king, and this is why we get this terrible situation. Um, the problem with that is that as we move forward to Samuel now, if that is true, okay, if the rule of judges was was not good, if this system of, of being ruled by judges was no good, then how do we explain the great success we read about under Samuel, who is a judge? Okay. And, and if the rule of judges is so not good, why is God so displeased when the people come to demand the king? Okay. Both Samuel and God clarify that uh, that Samuel should continue to rule as a judge. Okay, so, so at least from what we see in the in, in the book of Judges, we see evidence that actually God does support this form of government. Okay, God thinks that it's highly appropriate for Samuel to continue to serve as judge. Um, so there's this interpretation of this common refrain, in those days there was no king, everyone did as he pleased, uh, as, as a statement saying, as, as an indictment of judgeship and, and a statement in favor of kingship. Okay. Yet, in the book of Judges, we had Gideon speaking against monarchy. I shall not rule you, my son shall not rule you, God shall rule you. Okay. Um, and then the and, and then the book of Samuel is even more explicitly anti-monarchical. Okay. Um, and and in fact, not, not only is do you have that 
great speech by Samuel about the evils of monarchy and how it's a rejection of God and everything else. Um, but even before then, I don't know if you noticed, like, okay, so um, if you had to find evidence that the book of Samuel is against um, hereditary rule, what could you point to in Samuel before he explicitly says that kings are a bad deal? I want to say the ambiguity of uh, hered er, lineage in who Samuel's father is, or the the weird barrenness of mothers, and like this lifting of it, and who causes these children to be born or not. Yeah, but that's that's not. In, I mean, look. Uh, we, we don't, I mean, there's a debate about whether Samuel's father, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it today, whether it is, is a clown or, or a good guy, uh, just like we saw with Samson's father, again, similar situation. Um, but, but look, you know, obviously, if that's true, if what you're saying is true, that his father's a clown, look at Samuel. Samuel's a great guy, so you know, it, 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 it obviously doesn't mean that lineage produ reproduces the um, kind of the, the the fool of a father you have like, wh wh where do you see again uh, kind of the, the the idea of hereditary rule being shown by the author again before the speech uh, shown to be to, to produce bad results like in, in, in Samuel produced the good result he's a great guy Samuel so it would be a good guy producing bad results would yeah. be the demonstration yeah no I mean a, a good guy producing bad son a bad son. You know that if you have hereditary rule, you know that it, it, it's not a good idea to have the son succeed the father. Drawing a blank. It's the only son. Like, what sons do you have in this book? I mean, that Samuel, you read about. Saul. No, that, that you've read about. You haven't read it yet about Saul's uh, sons. Oh, okay, going back. Um, Look, there's Eli's. Yeah, about, Eli's yeah, sons. About. Pardon? I couldn't hear. Yeah, about. I, I, I can't hear. Hagal. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, in, in, in the... Uh, the, the, the argument is that the book of, uh, again, if, if we're to understand the, there was no king, each man did as he pleased, if we're to understand it as we're told to understand it, that it's an indictment of judgeship and a, uh, a statement in support of monarchy, then the obvious problem is the fact that um, that you have this statement from Samuel and from God that they're against monarchy and in favor of judgeship, not to mention the fact that uh, in the book of Judges itself, you know, you have Gideon speaking against monarchy. Okay, so I'm asking where in, so, so uh, what I'm suggesting is that even before Samuel speaks explicitly against monarchy, the, the author of Samuel uh, drops kind of a, a hint of his opposition to monarchy. You know, not only is he not in favor of monarchy, he's opposed to monarchy. Uh, so, so wh where do you see in Samuel, in the, in the chapters that you've read, uh, a statement against hereditary offices? Okay, so look, if, if you look back at, at, the, at, at the book of Judges, there's Iftah's son. Who becomes an evil, an evil king, okay? But but in the book of uh, the book of Samuel, what were you about to say, David? 
I was going back to. I was going uh, back to Cain, Isaac. No. Well, look, they, they weren't kings uh, or, or rulers. No, but just in Samuel. Okay? Think of Eli's sons. Eli is a good priest. His sons are terrible priests. They're corrupt. They're, they're uh, promiscuous. They're, I mean, they're, they're uh, profane. Not profane. Um, what do you call it? Loose. I can't think of the word now. Uh, and then you have Samuel's sons. Samuel is a good judge. His sons are terrible judges. Again, corrupt. Okay. Um, and so, so already before Samuel speaks explicitly about monarchy as a bad system of government, we see, before anyone speaks, we see that even a great uh, priest cannot reproduce himself in his sons. Even a great judge cannot reproduce himself, his, his goodness, in his sons. Okay? It's a bad deal to have the father bequeath the office to the son. Okay? Bad results follow if you have hereditary rule, like, like Eli tried to do and like Samuel tried to do. Um, and then, as you continue on, as we will continue on, reading in Samuel, you'll see that the, the stories of the first kings, of Samuel, uh, sorry, of Saul, excuse me, David and, uh, and, and Solomon, are written from the perspective of, of the opposition. The, the, the book of Samuel, the author of Samuel, paints Saul and David and even Solomon in a negative light. Okay, the, these kings, the ones in the book of Solomon, of Samuel, ugh, uh, these kings live up to Samuel's blistering speech, you know, his warning on the king's rule or the king's habit. The, it's called uh, it's called Mishpat HaMelech, okay, that, that speech about how kings rule. Uh, Samuel uh, chapter 8, verses 11 to 18. Okay, blistering anti-monarchical statement about the king will do this and will do this and only take your daughters and only take your sons and da 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 da. Okay, and then you have okay, so he's warning them, don't do it because this is how kings rule. And they said, forget it, we want a king. And you get Saul, and he lives up to that. You get David, he lives up to that warning. Solomon, same thing. Okay, and certainly if you keep on reading after Samuel into the Book of Kings. The later kings of Judea and Israel, the, both kingdoms, are not presented in a positive light. Okay, the, the, when, when you read the book of Kings, um, what you see is heroic prophets inveighing against kings for, for their misdeeds, okay, for all the wrongs and, and, and indiscretions and, and blasphemies that, that, that kings that, the, that those later kings will, will, will do. Okay. So my point is, <clears throat> my point is that if the judges' era really was so bad, as we're told to understand that common refrain, there was no king, each person did as he pleased. Just a second. <coughs> <coughs> okay. So if the rule of judges was so bad, why does God want it to continue? Okay, as we hear from Samuel's speech. Okay. Um, if the end of, of the book of Judges, you know, those two horrible stories about Micah's statue and, and the civil war and, 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 um, uh, and, and the war against Benjamin, if those last two stories that have that common refrain about there was no king and each person did as he pleased, if that's an argument in favor of monarchy, then why do Samuel and God argue against monarchy? Okay, so, so it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does, when you finish the book of Judges, is it really true that you're supposed to, um, to be ready for a monarchy? You know, is, is it true that the book of Judges um, is calling for a king, or in fact, does, does it oppose monarchy? Okay, so the, the, the question is, could it be 
and, and I'm, I'm really, I really am asking this, uh, could it be that actually that common refrain, there was no king then in Israel, each person did as he pleased, could it be that that should actually be read as a compliment? Okay. Oh, in those, those good old days, before there were kings, then things were great. You know? each, each person could do as he pleased. Okay, and that's how the book... Uh, could it be that it's not a criticism in the context of those two terrible stories, but in fact a uh, kind of a, an endorsement of the rule of judges rather than what you, the readers, live under, and that is a monarchy? Because, again, the, the book of Judges was written, obviously, after the period of the Judges. So sometime during the rule of... Saul or David or Solomon or later? It seems it uh, calls to mind uh, before the flood that in each person's heart is wickedness, um, which problem it's, and the need for the law in the first place. So when people do do what's right in their heart or in their own eyes, um, problems come up, which in the past had led to the flood, which led to there being a law which led to a deviation from the law, which how do we solve this? Right. Yeah, no, so look, the, 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 the Bible is consistent throughout that man's heart is, uh, or, or, or the impulse or the proclivities of man's heart are evil from, from his youth. Okay. Um, the question is, at least for the Israelites, um, what does that mean in terms of of, of, of the system of government that you should have. Now, one interpretation is that, that, that I've heard from commentators is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which system of government, whether it's elders or judges or kings, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is that the person in charge or people in charge need to be righteous, need to, to, to follow God, and you know, it, it doesn't matter which system of government as long as the people who govern are godly. Okay, that, that's one argument. Um, the other argument is that, again, what we read in Samuel's speech, where Samuel, as the voice of God and God himself, say, uh, I don't like monarchy. Monarchy is a bad deal. Um, and, and what I'm asking is if if, if you think that, uh, that w when you read that, th those last two stories in Judges, and that common refrain keeps saying, in those days there was no king, anyone did as he pleased, is that a complaint? A kind of an indictment of judgeship and, and, and a call for, for a more orderly society, a strong king that would put an end to this anarchy? Or is it... Uh, not sentimental, a nostalgic kind of, is that actually a positive statement? Could it be? Again, I'm not, is it possible that actually that's not a criticism, but a celebration or a, an endorsement? It would seem to me it could be an, an endorsement if from the point of view of whoever's made this, the narrator, um, if they thought that the the best life was to live a godly life, um, and each person's heart did not what was wicked, but what God wanted it, then it could be an endorsement. Mm. Like that seems like it would be the ideal, but we learned way back when before the flood that that's not how it works. Yeah, no, I I, th I think we can dismiss that. I, I think we have we know the biblical author well enough to know that he does not think that each person following his heart is a good <laughs> is, right. is is a good thing. So, then to me, it would have to be that it's everyone doing what's good in their own eyes or following their heart is not a good thing. Yeah. It's, they're not following the law, they're following what's in their heart. Yeah. Yeah, so look, something here doesn't work out. If, if that common refrain really is a criticism of judgeship and a call for monarchy, in those days there was no king and therefore it was terrible, therefore we need a king, then the transition to... The, the, Already, what we heard from Gideon is weird. 
you know, because he spoke against monarchy, and then we get a king, and it's terrible. Like we just saw a few stories ago that monarchy is a, even if you don't like judgeship, if you think it's terrible, you just had an example of kingship being much worse. And then you move forward to the book of, Judge, of Samuel, and you hear Samuel, the great Samuel, inveighing against monarchy and God, saying that monarchy is a bad deal. It's, it's a kind of a rebellion against God himself. Okay, so something here, th there's, there's something weird. So, uh, I mean, it's either the, the people who, who claim that there was no king, everyone did as he pleased, is an indictment of, of judgeship, need to explain, okay, then how come God and Samuel didn't get the message? Okay, and, uh, and those who say that it's a nostalgic and supportive uh, look on the past, um, need to, to, to explain it. Just, it like you said, it, it's odd for the biblical author to say each man did as he pleased as, 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 a, as a good thing, because in any case, um, there's, a, uh, there's a scholar by the name of Elias Sis, and, and he says that, that, that the answer is yes, you know, that that statement, there was no king in Israel, each person did as he pleased, was, uh, was a description of, of, of a, not ideal, but of, 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 of the preferred way of governing, uh, of the, the preferred system of government, government um, according to God, okay? And that is a system by which the Israelites are governed by the elders. Okay, so it says that the, that the ideal oh. leadership that the ideal leadership in Israel, according to God, is the elders. I'm sorry, what did you say? Um, I was just going to say that it makes sense because when you have when you have a king, it takes away from God. Um, Power. Yeah, no, look, I mean, you know, Samuel, Sam, Samuel says this explicitly, and God says it explicitly. Yeah. They're rejecting me. When they're asking the for a king, they're rejecting me. Exactly. So it makes sense that it would be a positive thing to say each man did it his own, because even if they are wicked, God is there and he'll put them back in line and he'll, you know, he'll manage the situation. But if you have a, if you have a king, Who's wicked? Right. Then he's yeah, not the, leading the people. Right. The the the, the, the problem is again uh, not only with the wicked king but also with the with the king's son. Okay? We see that a been that, that a great judge like Samuel can produce crummy offspring. You know who are dangerous if they if they succeed him. And the same with Eli, and the same with uh, Iftach. Okay, but um, okay. So, so what what what, Asi, what Eliasis says is that God's ideal form of leadership in, uh, for His people is to have a community that governs itself. Okay? And of course, when the elders cannot deal with some sort of a military crisis, military challenge, then they they hire or they they they, they lift up a military officer, a judge to do the job, like Ehud, like Barak, like Iftach, etc. Okay? And that's why, according to Assis, and, and Assis, I just want to clarify, is the, I, my senses, he's the minority position. Okay? Most people understand the end of Judges as a call to solve this problem by getting a king. But, um, but that's why, according to Assis, uh, why God, if you look back, uh, to, to, to the uh, entrance into the, into the land of Israel, why did God not appoint a leader to replace Moses? Okay, I don't know if you remember it, but uh, in, in Numbers, uh, at the end of Numbers, in, in, in chapter 27, um, Moses has to beg God to give the Israelites a new leader. Okay, and, and then God realizes, okay, Joshua will, uh, Joshua will, will, will replace you. Okay, but God doesn't, until Moses asks for a leader, God doesn't specify, okay, who will take over Moses' spot, Moses' role. And when Joshua, again, the first judge, 
when Joshua dies, again, God does not appoint a new leader. Okay, so the, the, the leadership model in the book of Judges seems to be the kind of the political philosophy of God. Okay? People living in a tribal organization, in a tribal, on e each tribe on its land, and each tribal elders leading that local community in that plot of land. Okay. And it seems, again, so, so you see this maybe even at the end of the Torah, when God doesn't initiate, doesn't, you know, doesn't initiate a replacement for Moses, definitely at the end of, uh, of Joshua, when, okay, they conquer the land, each tribe in its own territory governing itself without a new Joshua. Uh, and it seems that God is still committed to that at the end of the book of Judges, at the end of the era of the Judges, which is what we're reading about here in, in, uh, in the beginning of Samuel, um, where, uh, where, where you see you know, Eli serving as a judge. It says that Eli judged the people. And then Samuel uh, serving as a judge. Okay, so it seems that, again, that, that, that system of tribes governing themselves by the rule of the elders and then producing a judge to do A, B, and C, it seems that God is consistent on that from the entry into the land of, uh, of Israel until, well, un until the chapters that you've just uh, read in which God speaks openly against monarchy. Okay. And, it, and it's even more understandable when you consider that this system, of the, this system of having a judge lead the Israelites clearly produced, uh, is producing good results in the fight against Israel's oppressors. Okay, because you see in the book of, in, in what, what you've read here in Samuel at the beginning, when, when it's still a judge rather than a king, the people unite under Samuel, and God himself participates in the war against the Philistines, that God strikes at the Philistines and leads the Israelites to victory and to liberation. Okay, so, so yeah. not only does God speak in favor of it, but it, it's producing good results against, against the, the oppressors. Okay. And look, even, even as, uh, we, we talked about this last week, uh, even in that bizarre story of, of the concubine, at the end of, uh, of, of the book of Judges, um, we see even there that this form of leadership of, of the elders can unite the nation. Okay? You, you saw in that story, all the tribes joined forces to go to war against the, the, the tribe of Benjamin for its outrageous behavior without a king, without even a judge, just the elders. And the tribes then impose a national discipline on the whole nation by, if you remember, punishing the, the people of, uh, of Yavesh Gilad for not joining that war against Benjamin. Okay. And then the tribal elders find a way to make, you know, a after they lead that war, the tribal elders find a way to make the nation hold again, to, you know, to reconstruct the nation, uh, by, by, divine, by finding a way to reintegrate Benjamin back into the nation with that, you know, that we're not going to give them our daughters, but we're going to let them kid, kidnap daughters so that the tribe of Benjamin won't perish from, from, from Israel. Okay? So all this is done without a national leader to orchestrate all this. Okay, so, so, so that story actually shows, um, even before Samuel comes onto the scene, the people acting together organically under the traditional leadership of the tribal elders of, of the 12 tribes. Okay, so look, I, I, I don't know exactly how to solve it. I'm, I'm leaning towards Eliasis uh, in this. Um, but David, you're right. You know, it, it just sounds wrong to the ear each man did as he pleased, given what we know about the biblical, uh, the, the, the Bible's understanding of human nature, 
That sounds like a dangerous thing. Okay? But to, 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 to Tal's point, that human nature is also, also resides in the king's heart. You know, is, it, is it better to have a king who does as he pleases? In any case, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's some, something here, it calls out to a solution. Uh, and I think Assis's solution is less problematic. I mean, they're, they're both problematic, but I think this one is less problematic than the other one, simply because we have... It can't be that the Book of Judges calls for monarchy when throughout it spoke against monarchy, especially in the Yiftach story, and the fact that in the next book you have Samuel and God himself speaking against monarchy. So that, that, that's more of an obstacle to me than, than the other way around. But again, like I said, it's a, it's a problem. Um, okay. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So it seems like there's a, like, even if we go before that, it seems like if we keep tracing, like the ideal would be that people do what's in their own, or what's right in their own eyes and in their heart, and that be to do the godly thing. We go back to, to Adam. I don't, he wasn't committing any of these things that, happened later in Judges and Samuel, um, but it still wasn't good for him to be alone. Then when he's got a, another person with him, there's the whole eating of the tree thing, and then there's Cain, who kills his brother. Like It yeah, seems yeah. like mm. this political thing where there's... Uh, I, I can buy that the ideal would be doing right what's in uh, your own eyes if what's in your own eyes is always the right thing. Right, but but that but and as soon as there's a problem with it, then there's a compromise, and that compromise is never the ideal. Right. So, so look, we we know that the, the the chronicle of human history in the Bible clarifies that when people do what's in their own heart, they're not doing the godly thing. Okay, because as God comes to understand, and as we hopefully come to understand as we read, um, man's the the the. The natural inclination of man's heart is toward, towards evil. Okay? Uh, and so, look, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's a problem. You know, that, so so that, that, that common refrain, if it, is, if, if it really means everyone did what's in their own heart, we're conditioned by our familiarity with the biblical author to see that as a criticism. Okay? But... We can all read Hebrew, and we can see that what God says in the next book is a criticism of monarchy, not a celebration of monarchy. Okay, so 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 these that that common refrain at the end of Judges clashes with what Samuel and God say, what Samuel and God say in Samuel clash with what Iftach says. No, I'm sorry, not Iftach, Gideon. What Gideon says and, and what happens with Gideon's son, Avimelech. Uh, so look, there, there's a clash here, and it needs to be solved. I don't know exactly how to solve it. It just seems to me that, the, that uh, Assis's answer, his solution, to say that this is not a criticism, it's, a, it's an outlining of the ideal system where communities govern themselves, or at least, at least that there's no king. Uh, the problem with that is less significant. The, 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 the problem that that solution introduces is still a problem, but it's less problematic than the other way around. You know, if, if the, 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 the contrary explanation, you know, this saying that there was no king, everyone did as he pleased, is a, an indictment of judgeship and a call to monarchy clashes head-on like two Mack trucks with what Samuel and God himself say in the next book. Okay, so to me that is much more, a, 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 a much higher obstacle than, than, than the other one, the, the more philosophical one about, the, about human nature. Although, again, I acknowledge it's, it's a solution that I can't, it's a, that too is a problem that I can't really solve, but it's it's easier for me to live with that, with a small contradiction, than with a huge contradiction. Well, can I, uh, I don't know if this works, but like, is it in, is there a consistent indictment that goes all the way back that this is a part of, of imposing 
uh, of trying to redirect uh, humans' initial inclinations. Because, like, the law was a compromise. Like, that goes way back. Yeah. And then a judge is a compromise. Like, even having a Moses was a compromise. Having a judge was a compromise. It's, it just keeps on, it seems like a trajectory. Yeah. But, that, but, but again, if that is the case, at the end of Judges, why is God and Samuel not on board with this compromise? I mean, they, they, they think it's a... Not, not only do they not think... It, not only do they think it's unwise to institute a monarchy, they think it's... I mean, not, maybe not sinful, but, but they see it as a kind of rebellion against God, a rejection of God. Well, did God think that any of the prior compromises was good? He never, not, not, like only did, yeah, not only did he not say he had a problem with it, he instituted them. You know, he picked, he picked Moses. He gave Moses the authority. He picked... Uh, but after Joshua. Moses, the, there, was the, there was the battle. There was the conference, or there was the, the rub. It, it didn't happen immediately. There was like a, something that made it necessary, whereas he didn't want to do it. Is this similar, or is there something weird about kingship? Look, it, uh, if that's true, if, if what you're saying is true, that God had to overcome something, you know, but, but, but he did. Okay? He instituted the judgeship of, of Joshua. He raised Ehud. He raised Deborah or Barak or, or, and, and Gideon. Okay? He did it. Okay? Here in, in, in the book of Samuel, God is, yeah, again, Sa Samuel is telling the, uh, the people, don't do it. But God goes along with it, is kind of sides with Samuel in this, and he says, the people are rejecting me. By asking for monarchy, they're rejecting me. So he's not, um, you're right that he is, that, you know, God picks Saul, and God picks David. Okay, so God is involved. But we've we've just ne we've never heard God, or any of his uh, spokespeople, speak against the previous systems of, of leadership that we've seen. We've never heard. And again, maybe God would prefer um, not to have a not to have a Moses, not to have a judge. But, we, but he's you know he's always done it without complaining, and here. He's doing it. He's doing, you know, the people demand it. Fine, I'll do it. But he's making his voice clear against it. Okay, so again, I, I, I can't solve it. I, I, I don't know how to solve the, the contradiction between that refrain at the end of Judges and God's position starkly against monarchy. And, it's a, and, and a position against monarchy has kind of a... a we see this indictment of monarchy before Samuel in the Gideon and Avimelech story, in the, uh, I, I think, in, in the fact that Samuel's sons are crappy and Eli's sons are crappy, and we see it moving forward. We read about all these evil kings, Saul, David, Solomon, and their successors. I mean, and not evil, but, you know, that, that the rule of kings conforms exactly, one-to-one, -to, -one, to what Samuel warns them will happen. Okay, so it seems to me that there's such a large body of indictments against monarchy before Samuel and after Samuel. It, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a big hill to climb, to, uh, at least from my, my perspective. And, and, and that's why, again, I, what, what Elias says, even though it it still packs a, a certain problem. It, it, well, I'm just repeating myself. It's, it's, it's less problematic. Um, okay, look, I, I want us to devote some time to Hannah before we dive into Samuel himself um, and, and, and back into this speech about the king's rule because Hannah's story is, I think, the most personal story we ever get about a woman in the entire Bible. Um, the only competition f uh, for, for a personal story about a woman is the story of Leah and, uh, and Rachel 
which happens to be the exact parallel to this story. Okay, the, the, the story of Leah, uh, of, of Leah and Rachel is the exact same story of Pnina and Hannah. Okay, so, so really the, the two most personal stories, number one and number two, and number two and number one, are, are this story. Just change the, change the, word, the, the names and it's the same exact story. Um, so I, I, asked you, I asked you in the email to consider why uh, our barren ladies in the Bible are, are barren or were, were barren. Okay, we, we have these very important women who were barren. Uh, and then God miraculously opened their wombs to produce important figures in the founding of, this, uh, of, of the Israelite nation. Um, so we have two options to consider. Either God intervened to make them barren, or they were barren naturally. It's just an accident of... Uh, of biology. Okay, so which, you know, if, if, if you read the story of Sarah and uh, Rebecca and Rachel and, and Samson's mother and, and uh, Samuel's mother, um, what, what's your take on it? What, why, why are barren women barren? I always took it as a natural Thing that happened, and he opened their wounds. I never even considered the option of him closing their wounds. Well, okay. So, so what, what? What gave you that impression? I mean, what? What evidence um, is there for for nature as as the cause of barrenness? I mean, obviously, look, you got that impression somehow. Evidence in the text. Pardon. Evidence in the text? Yeah. yeah I mean, like, like evidence in the text they see for it being natural? Yeah, like uh, how, how did you form this impression? Because um, I, never, I never saw anything in the text that made me think otherwise. Right. It was just a fact that they're barren. Exactly. Look, they, and they, they, they yearned for a child, but they, they always ask for a miracle. It's not like they ask to take off the curse that someone put on them or right. it, it never seemed like it was something that was put on them but something they were they had and they wished it was different but yeah I, I wish I, w I weren't like this yeah so, so so you're right the evidence for for nature is that no explanation is offered okay the Bible simply says this woman had no children you know, or she was barren she couldn't have children okay um, which the Bible says about all these women. All these women said, yeah, yeah, and she didn't have children. Okay. What's the evidence for the other position? You know, for, for, say, for, for the idea that, that God closed their womb. I would say the effect of um, these barren mothers uh, having children uh, highlights their offspring in a certain way that wouldn't be true if they had lots of children. Um, it makes this a miraculous event somehow that um, uh, draws our attention to uh, what happens as a result of this. Right. No, yeah, but, but, but look, but, but that, could be, uh, th that could be the effect of God miraculously intervening to, clo to make her barren or with her being naturally barren. Okay. So, so, so the evidence that they were naturally barren is what Tal said, that you know that in all these cases, the, bi the biblical author says, um, yeah, she was barren, she had no kids. Okay. If you go back, in, in, but if you go back to, look, if you, if you open uh, Genesis 16, Uh, 16 verse 2 I have uh, and Sarah said to Abram look 
the Lord has kept me from bearing consort with my right. maid, perhaps I shall have a son. Right. Her. Okay. Now, so that's Sarah. Okay. Now look at Rachel. Rachel is in uh, Genesis 30. 30. Also, verse, verse 2. See, Rachel? Yeah, I have, uh, Jacob was incensed. So, 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 so she, uh, actually, let's go to, to one. So, so uh, Rachel was, jeal was uh, you know, she didn't have uh, children. She was uh, jealous of her sister. And she tells Jacob, give me sons or else uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll die. Okay? I'll and die. Then, yeah. And then what does he say? Um, she said, yeah. So she gave him. Uh, in, in two, verse two. Jacob is incensed. Okay. Yeah, Jacob is incensed. Can I take the place of God who has denied you fruit of the womb? Right. Okay. So I'm, you know, I'm God who, 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 who stopped you from having kids. Okay. And then, if you go back to, to our story, Samuel, uh, Samuel, Samuel. Uh, this is chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, but to Hannah he would give one portion only, though Hannah was his favorite. The Lord had closed her womb. Moreover, yeah. her rival to make her miserable would taunt her uh, that the Lord had closed her womb. Okay. So, we have evidence, as Tell, as, as Tell pointed out, that the Bible doesn't say, you know, the Bible simply describes them as barren. Okay? Um, in evidence for miraculous barrenness, you know, that, that God is making her barren, is also there in the text, as we've just read, all these examples. Okay, so what's, what's, the, um, so what's the answer? You know, if, if the Bible at times says nothing about God's role, and at other times mentions God's role, what are we to take as the answer to this question as to, you know, why are women barren? You can just take it as is, that sometimes it's a natural occurrence where God wasn't involved, and he's involved in undoing the natural well, the, 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 phenomenon. The, the problem is, look, we, we've had, um, so the, we have five mothers, five barren mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Samson's mother, and Hannah. Okay? Of these five, I think all five, the, 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 the Bible says they were just barren, and then at other times, about three of them, Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah, the, the, there's, there's something here about God closing their womb, okay? three out of the five. And even in these three earlier, the Bible, or, or at other points, the Bible simply says that, they're, uh, that they didn't have children. Okay, look, look, look closer at, at what's told to us about Hannah's barrenness. Uh, again, in, in, in these two verses that you just read, in 5 and 6. Okay? So... Uh, Can I ask? Yes. Just real quick. <laughs> so this is probably coming from Greece, but, or a Greek thought, but like God being the author of nature, in which case... Like, is there a real distinction between God and nature? Well, um, look, there's... I don't... Uh, yeah, no, 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 there's... First of all, in, in this regard, uh, as, as we'll see in a second, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for now, but rains happen in, in the Bible, okay? And at other times, rain happens because God made it rain. Okay, like, like the flood 
is not a the Noah's flood is not a natural occurrence. Okay, but other rains are just rains. Okay, um, so look, when God created the heavens and the earth, He made a sun that makes its way across the sky regularly. Okay, He made um, you know the laws of physics that make water run downhill, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now He can intervene and make the laws of physics stop, like parting the Red Sea. Or he can make it rain on command, either to help the Israelites or to punish the Egyptians or whatever else. Okay? But there's no indication that the sun rising every morning is God deciding, I'm going to raise the sun. Okay? He created a world in which the sun rises and in which rain falls okay? and in which disease happens. And Again, if we're to follow Tal's logic here, barrenness happens. Okay. So, look, but, but, but the question with, with barrenness is that, look, we have two sets of data here. Okay. On the one hand, when we're introduced to these barren women, we're told, you know, and, and she was barren. And again, this is a condition that, that the readers would know. You know. Some women are barren. Okay. But in other spots, it says, look, this is not just a naturally occurring condition of barrenness, God closed her womb. That's why she's barren. I would argue that because he doesn't, it doesn't happen to all five women, just uh, three of them and not in every, not in every description, it, it says that God closed her womb. It actually womb. happens, it happens to be the first, the third, and the fifth. I don't know if that's significant. I don't think it's significant. I would, I would say that it's a, a description of a human of human nature that um, she's barren. She's known as the barren woman. I mean, she's barren, but the way she explains it, or her husband ex explains it, or you know, the the village explains it, is by saying God closed her womb because it's not natural. Okay. That's true, and I want to prove to you that it's true. Uh, so let's start with Hannah, okay, what we just read. Okay. Um, so th th those two verses that, that, David, that you read earlier, uh, chapter, Samuel chapter 1, 5 and 6, uh, verse 5 and 6, uh, da -da -da, da -da -da. Um, and he gave Hannah a double portion because he loved Hannah, and God, or because God, closed her womb. And her, and, and, and the second wife, um, and, and, and Pnina. Uh, actually, uh, David, how does it, uh, how, how does verse 6 start for you? Or over her rival. Yeah, rival, okay. Um, that her rival w was, was angry about Hannah getting a double portion of the food. Um, Da, 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 um, where is it? Yeah. Be, because God closed her womb. Okay? Compare that to verse 2, where the biblical author said, And he, Elkanah, had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other was Pina. Um, and Pina had children, and Hannah had no children. So in these three instances, is these three instances all had rivalries between two women, Sarah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And actually, and that's, the other two actually, that's did a, not that's have a, a that's a very good point. I didn't even think of that. That the three that the three cases in which we're told that God did it are the three cases where there's conflict about it. With with Samson's mother, there's no conflict, and with uh, Rebecca, there's no conflict. But Sarah and Hagar. Uh, Rachel and Leah, and uh, what's her name, Hannah and, and Pnina, there's a conflict, and, and you can see that, the, the, look, the difference between verse 2, where the biblical author is speaking, and verse 5, where Elkanah, I mean, he's not speaking, but it's, it's, it's Elkanah's thinking that's represented here, and verse 6, where Pnina's thinking is represented. Okay? It says that, uh, Verse 2, where, the, again, this is the biblical author talking, says, 
this one's name is this, this one's name is that, this one had children, this one didn't have children. Okay? But then when it turns to the characters who are in the story, Elkanah favors Hannah because he believes God closed her wound. He feels compassion for her. Prina is angry at Hannah by saying, you know, he conveys her anger at, at, uh, at Hannah by saying that God closed Hannah's wound, uh, womb. Okay, but the biblical author simply says she had no children. Okay, now let's go back to the other two, uh, two women uh, about which God is blamed for, the, for, for their barrenness. Okay, so go back uh, as, as we, to, to the two verses we just read in Genesis 16.2. Genesis 16.2. Okay, 16.2 and, th and 32. Okay, what does it say there? So I have in uh, 16.2, And uh, Sarai said to Abram, Look, the Lord has kept me from bearing. Right. And sort with my maid. Perhaps right. I shall have a yeah. son. Okay. And then 32. Jacob was incensed at Rachel and said, Can I take the place of God who has denied you the fruit of the womb? Okay. She said, here is yeah. my okay, man, yeah, Bill Hall. Yeah, fine. Okay. So, 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 so again, what, what, what do you see in, 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 these, in these two verses? Like, what's the, the pattern? That the, uh, um, that the husband blames it on God. Well, not, not I mean, the, the husband and Jacob, but not Abraham. It's Sarah blames it. Oh, sir. Yes. The people there blame is, it on God. Yeah, people blame it on God. Okay, it's never the biblical author that pins the blame, the blame on God. Okay, we saw with Sarah, with Hannah, the biblical author says she's barren. It's the people who pin it on God. Okay, and the same thing here. Sarah says God is keeping me from having children. Jacob tells Rachel in his anger, "God made you made you barren. What, what are you complaining to me? What do you want from me?" Take it up with God. He's the one who made you barren. Okay? So, look, if, if, if the, all know, the, the, the biblical author is an all-knowing author, as we've already established. Okay? He looks at the drama from above. Can, he can see everything. Okay? You, know, so, so, you, you know that in some novels, the, the, the narrator isn't in a position to know everything that's happening. You know, like... Sometimes the author is in the story, so he is witness to what's happening here. He has no way of knowing what's happening beyond that hill or at a different time. The biblical author knows everything. Okay? So if, if the all-knowing author ever told us God closed this woman's womb, you know, we, we'd have to believe him you know, because he's an all-knowing author. Okay? That's why we believe him when, we tell, when, when he tells us repeatedly that God opened these women's uh, wombs. Okay, you know, the author said so. You know, so um, we know when, when, when Samson's mother has, has a child, or when Hannah has a child, or Rebecca, or Rachel, we know that it's not, oh, well, you know, she just relaxed, and, and okay, and, 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 and she became, you know, that the, the barrenness was because of her anxiety, and once she relaxed, she naturally had a child. No. Okay, the biblical author tells us it was a divine intervention. And we believe him because, again, we, we have to believe an all-knowing author, whenever, whichever novel we're reading. Okay. Um, so uh, so the, the, the point is that whenever the biblical author tells us about a woman's barrenness, he simply says, you know, she's barren. She's barren. He doesn't present it as a divine act to make her barren. The, the idea that a woman is barren because God intervened to close her wound is always, without exception, presented as a human understanding of barrenness. Okay? It's not the biblical author's understanding of barrenness. And I think the key is, is what you mentioned, uh, David, which again, I didn't notice it, that in all three, um, there's a conflict in the family. Okay? There's a, the, the, this 
barren mother has some sort of political rival inside the family uh, that, that is uh, bringing this anxiety, this, this, this claim to the fore, either as an accusation by somebody else or as a complaint by, by, by the mother herself. God did this to me, and, and God can undo it. Um, now, why are barren women so miserable and, and scorned and pathetic and, and, and pitiable? Like, what, 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 why, why is the condition of being a barren woman so harmful and hurtful? And, and yeah, w w yeah. W why are they so miserable? Why is it such an unbearable condition to be? To be in. Because if you can't have kids, then you can't give your husband a successor. Just right, like so in the monarchy, that if a wife can't bear children, then they'll just take a different wife because she, she can't give him what he needs. Right. So look, f f uh, you're right. M mostly, it's it's for failing. You know, the, the, these barren women are failing in their biological, but mostly their, their societal mission to the family or, or to the husband. Okay, so she, she's seen as a, as a, as a failure. Yeah, I, I married you in order to have children with you. And, you know, I did my part, you didn't do your part. Um, and, 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 and the result of being this kind of failure or the, the result in a tribal or in a traditional society for a barren woman is that you become a marginal member of the family and, and, and you become a drain on the family you know, because, because this woman is not contributing what women are expected to contribute. Okay? Just like if, a, if you have a, a boy, a son, and he doesn't join the men of the tribe when they go to war, or he doesn't help defend the flocks, or he doesn't tend to the flocks, he doesn't do work because he's, I don't know, he likes reading or something, uh, then he's a drain on the family. You know? He was brought here, he was m created to work, to defend, to go to war, and if he's not doing these, he's, he's failing his role. Okay? So, um, Okay, so, so, so women who failed to provide children, especially sons, uh, for, for their husband, fell short of fulfilling their, like you said, their, their femininity. Okay, so, so yes. Um, and then on top of that, on a more material level, which we discussed before, a barren woman is extremely vulnerable. Yeah, because if her husband dies to mo on, on a material level, economic level, if her husband dies tomorrow in sickness, in battle, accident, uh, or just if time passes and, and, and the husband grows feeble with age, what would, who, who would provide for this woman? Like, okay, let's assume that, uh, um, again, if, if, if Rachel didn't have children and Jacob died, or if Hannah, who doesn't have any children, if tomorrow Elkanah dies, who would provide for, for, for Hannah? Um, I don't know if she's got a brother or... Well, she's, you know, the brother's in another family. Right. Even, even if she does, look, she's got a brother, she's got a, an uncle. Yeah, you have, yeah. The, you have the laws of Ayibun. Uh, Yeah, no, but, but, um, so it, uh, I don't know what it's called in English either, where the, um, the next man in line, so, so, so the, the husband's brother or cousin or whatever, um, can, you know, is, is obligated, is, is expected, is, is expected yeah. to take, to, to marry her and take her into his family. Okay. The book of Ruth comes to mind. Exactly. Exactly. That's what happens there. Okay. But so so look so so either either another man 
is obligated to take her in. You know, he's not interested in marrying her, but it's a duty, and so you're, you're going to do it. Or, or what? If that doesn't happen, or she, um, or, or or if there's no okay, 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 there's always another okay, but okay, or what? A uh, beggar. Well, b before you send her out to beg on the street and prostitute herself, what's the other option? Because look, if, if, if Jacob dies, or, or, let, uh, or Elkanah, if Elkanah dies tomorrow, what happens to the family? Go back to the parents if they're still alive. Wait, I, I, I couldn't hear. He can go back to the parents. If he, if yeah, yeah, no, but, but that, that, again, so, so you know, either his brother takes her, takes her in or her father takes her back in, but yeah, she, she goes into somebody else's family as, as a hanger-on, as, as another, as a, okay, but, but, but before then. Or she can stay in her own family, but kind of be on the outs. Right, so, so who, who, who's in charge of the family now that Elkanah is dead? It would probably be the other woman ah. until her sons become of age. The, the son, exactly. The eldest son of the other woman now becomes the head of the family. Yeah, the father's dead. The eldest son succeeds. Okay? So, so the grown children of the other wives, the fertile wives, yeah, the, the, the wives with which this woman was competing with for affection and resources, throughout the marriage. Remember remember the competition between Leah and Rachel and here between Penina and, uh, and um, Hannah. Okay? So this is your rival. As it says, it says the word rival. Tzara in, in Hebrew. Okay? Um, so the, 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 chil the male children of your rival are the ones who are going to provide for you in your old age. Okay? It's a very vulnerable position. You know, you have no, no person. You know, the, the only person that, that is your caretaker, that is your Social Security insurance, is your husband. If he's gone, you have nothing. You depend on the charity of strangers. Whether it's that brother or cousin who will agree to take you in, or go back to your father who you know, also doesn't have resources to... to, to to spare, and again, you're not going to be a productive member of his household either, or you're going to depend on the, again, the, the charity of your rival's son. Okay, so the point is you become, it, it's, it's an insecure position to be in. Okay. Um, and, and like you said, if, 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 if Leah's son, Reuben, or Pnina's son, won't support her, uh, then, like you said, she, got, she has to go back to her father's or her brother's or her uncle's home, uh, where there too, she's way, way down on the totem pole. Okay. The only sure provider uh, a woman has, in case her husband dies or, or is sidelined, are her own children, uh, her, her own male children. Yeah, because they will have their own households, and they can feed their mother, or pr and protect her, their mother, etc. Okay, without a son, this woman has no insurance policy against old age or sickness or poverty, etc. Okay, so it's a it's a hard thing. You know, we have to really kind of, as modern readers, to kind of construct ancient society in order to understand the implications and and to understand this really. Tremendous anguish that we're reading about in these in these women, okay? Uh, because we live in a very different kind of family, and a diff in a different kind of culture, as far as the paths uh, that women have toward fulfillment and accomplishment, and and the paths that women have towards economic security. Okay, and this is it, we we have to imagine a society where you're, you you strip all the experiences that you know that women have in our society. Okay. Um, so, so now consider Hannah's anguish 
as it's described in, in chapter 1 here. Okay. So think of, how, of, of, of the story that's, that's painted for us in, in, in Samuel. Okay. Every year, where is it? Here. Uh, every year, they go up to Shiloh for a ritual family offering to God, you know, to, to make the sacrifice. Uh, and, and again, the, the audience back then, in let's say a thousand BC, when, when this was when this was written or when this was first read, let's say, um, the audience back then would understand the context intuitively. Okay, when when when, when you offer uh, um, a the, 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 when you go and have a ritual meal at the temple. Uh, th this is a public sacrifice in which th th there are different kinds of sacrifices. Um, you know, s s some are sacrificed where, where you, some, you give the sacrificed animal to the, to the priests and they slaughter it and sacrifice it and, and, and eat parts of it. And this, this particular sacrifice that they're, that they're offering is a sacrifice in which the giver eats the offering after giving some of it to the priest. Okay, so you give the animal to the priest, he slaughters it, sacrifices it, the priest takes a cut, and then you and your family uh, eat it together there. Okay, so, so when, when, when the readers of the story or listeners to the story originally hear it, they know what you and I don't because we don't offer sacrifices, that this sacrifice is a public meal. Okay, so every year, they go up to the temple, and every year, Hannah already knows what's coming. Okay? The other wife, Pina, will get many portions of food to distribute, to distribute among her multiple sons and daughters. Okay? The, the, the text tells us about you know, sons and daughters. You know, this a uh, fertile woman. Okay? Okay, whereas, so, so Hannah knows, okay, we're going to go there, and then in public, my husband will go and give Pnina a big cut for all of her children. Okay, whereas she, Hannah, in public, with everyone seeing her shame, will get only one lonely, lonely portion. Okay, so, you, so, so you, you, again, given what the audience knows about barren women and this offering and that scene that's painted for us about the public meal, um, you know, they, they can imagine the emotional stress in the weeks before the trip and during the trip to Shiloh and before the ritual even starts with Hannah dread, dreading once again going through this public humil humiliation, you know, having her barrenness paraded for all to see. Okay. So, uh, and, and of course, Elkanah also knows this. Okay. Elkanah sees her sorrow and tries to console her, you know, to give her a better seat at the table, gives her a bigger pe uh, portion of meat. Now, uh, now, Elkanah has been, I think this is what David was uh, referring to earlier, Elkanah has been taken to task by, I think, many commentators, but certainly some commentators, as, as dense. You know, that, that he's a typical man, doesn't understand his wife's heart, or, or doesn't understand women. Uh, because uh, Samuel 1, because... Um, da -da. Here, uh, verse 8, he asks her, um, Hannah, why do you cry? Why don't you eat? Why do, does your heart feel bad? Okay, that so, you know, this, this fool, again, his, his critics, uh, the, the, these commentators say, he just doesn't, he, he, he's callous. Okay, his wife is suffering tremendously and and he, and he doesn't understand, okay, that, that you know, it, it should be obvious, even to the densest of husbands, 
why she's upset. And then, to take it further, when he tells her that, you know, why do you cry? I'm better for you than ten sons. Okay. Again, how can you not understand that, that a loving husband cannot, represent, uh, cannot replace children for a woman who desperately wants to be a mother? Okay, so, so it's, again, Elkanah, um, there's, a, there's a body of literature about Elkanah the dummy, or Elkanah the callous husband, or Elkanah the dim man. Um, and I, I, think it's a, I think it's a recurring theme in modern commentary uh, on the few, th- there are few biblical stories in which a woman is the heroine. Okay. And I think uh, in all these cases, there's this recurring theme among modern commentators that the man in the story is an object of ridicule. Okay. That when the woman is, is highlighted, the man is ridiculed. Okay. Take, for example, Barak in the Deborah story, or Manoach, Samson's father in, in that story, or Elkanah here. Okay, so I, I, I can see it in, in Deborah. I mean, I agree with this observation about the man being ridiculed in Deborah and Barak because there it's explicit. Deborah says in her own words, you will not get the credit. A woman will get the credit. Okay. As we discussed with Samson, I don't, I don't agree that, Sam, that Manoach is, is an object of ridicule or, or criticism in that story. Um, but, but how about here in, in this story? What, what, um, do you agree with the, with the critique of, of Elkanah, that, that he's, common, uh, that, that he's uh, comical or, or dense? I've never read it that way, so I don't... It, I, I didn't know it was even an option. Right, but 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 now that Elaine, let, let let's assume that I send you to one of the authors who sound, it sounds strange to me because I've always read it as being compassionate. I've never read it as being um, dense or, you know, I did read it as being a man. I mean, he he's a man, and he doesn't fully understand. He understands enough to give her a second portion or a bigger portion. So he right. does understand. It, it, he's not dense. Otherwise, he wouldn't. He would just give her a, a one person's portion, and that's it. Yeah. Well, so look. The let, fact let, that he mm-hmm. gives her an extra, a bigger portion, and it and it bothers Pnina shows you that he is doing something not custom. Right. To to her being one person, she's getting more food than she needs. Well, look. Let let so, let, let, let let's go to that um, when when he asks her. Uh, again, verse 8. Uh, why do you cry? Why don't you eat? Why, why do you feel bad? Is he really... Not because is... he, he sees what's happening. He sees no, but, but, his wife is... But, but is, is he really... The, 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 the commentators, the crit, his critics, are saying, how can you ask? It's obvious. You know, the, the, the fact that you have to ask is evidence that, that he's callous. And I think, I, look, I, I, I think you're right. He's, he's not really asking, you know. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a question. Exactly. It's, it's, he's trying, you know, just like in our homes today, if you see somebody who's crying, you'll go up to him, even though you saw him, whatever, you saw what happened to him, you would say, what happened? Why are you crying? Why, yeah, why are you, you crying? Know why yeah. crying? Yeah. You know well, why he's crying. You know why he's crying. Why are you crying, little Timmy? Right. Yeah, look, he, he obviously yeah. understands that she's crying over her barrenness because he's offering consolation that minimizes the importance of, of children. Okay? If he didn't know that it's about the barrenness, he wouldn't say, I'm better for you than 10 sons. Okay? He's, he's saying, you know, accept my love as a substitute for children. My companionship is better for you than, than 10 sons, so why are you crying? You've got a better deal because you have my love. Okay, so so I, I think the first accusation is baseless on, on the basis of the text, not, not human understanding, but the fact that he says, why are you crying? I'm better for you than ten sons, means that he does know why she's crying. He's not really asking, like you said. Okay? But how about the accusation that he's dense 
for thinking that a good man can replace children in a barren woman's heart. Is, is that, uh, again, the, the, so, so there are two kind of, two acts that earn him this kind of, this, this criticism. The one is the question, the other is this, I'm better for you than ten sons. Is that... Um, well, in the one, is in that the one case, in the one case, if she wants children, then this, a husband isn't going to make up for that. In the other case, that the husband dies, which no one has, like the husband's going to die one day. Mm -hmm. And if she's left behind, it doesn't, she's completely vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Look, and, 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 you know, not, not to mention the fact that a woman who wants children, look, obviously she already has the husband. She, a child, thank goodness, in most cases, is not like a child. Okay, it, you know, he's, the, 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 the relationship is different. The, the, what it gives the woman is different. Okay? But the question is, look, again, the, the accusation is that he's callous, that he doesn't understand his wife, that, he, that, that, that he's either dense or that he's callous. Uh, but let, let me ask you this way. If, he, if, if Elkanah understood her heart completely and was sensitive to her and... and yeah, and if if he was a model husband, would he say anything different? Okay, like what what would what would he say that wouldn't earn him this criticism? Yeah, you know, instead of saying I'm better for you than ten sons, what would he say? Or what could he say? I guess I think of Jacob. Jake, he could make it very well known that he favors her. Oh well, yeah, he, that, that he does. But look, J Jacob said to his to his wife in the same situation, "What do you want from me? Take it up with God. God made you barren. Leave me alone." Look, we we um, anyone familiar with uh, with with sitcoms or with romantic comedies? Well, about married couples. Uh, and and any, anyone who's, who's been in a, in a long-term relationship uh, knows that wives often complain that their husbands try to fix their problems instead of just listening to their problems. And like, I don't need you to solve my problem. I just want you to, uh, to listen to me and to sympathize with me as I'm dealing with, my own prob with, my, with this problem. Okay, it's, a, it's a known relationship issue between men and women. Okay. There's, um, do, do you know that, uh, that clip uh, about, about, the, about the nail in the head? Okay, so, oh, you know? Yeah. Okay, so, so um, David, write, write yourself a note uh, to, uh, afterwards to Google or to YouTube. Uh, it's called, It's Not About the Nail. Okay, and it's about this thing about, again, it, it, it's a known thing about men and women that women complain that the husband isn't listening to them. He's trying to fix their problem, and that's not what I'm trying, not, 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 to, not what I need from you, not what I want from you. Uh, and, of course, the husband saying, no, you have a problem. You do want this from me. You don't know it, but you want me to solve your problem, so you won't have a problem, and, and your life will be fine. Um, in any case, so, so here you have a husband being a husband. Okay? He wants to help his beloved wife. Okay? But I, I, think, I think what you see here is Elkanah wants to help his wife come to terms with her situation in the family. Okay? Dude, you're barren. Okay? I want to help you accept your lot in life. Okay? You're barren. You're barren. Which means that your situation in the family is the way it is. And he, and he wants to help her come to terms with it. Okay? So he's offering her an extra portion of love and support and an extra, an extra meat at the table to help her see what she does have. Okay? Yes, you don't have children. You're barren. Accept it. But look at what you do have. You have the love and support and material support of a good man. Okay? So instead of focusing on what you don't have, and you won't have it because you're barren. 
accept it. Okay? Look at what you, what you do. Look at your status in the family. You're the favored wife. I love you, not your womb. I love you for you, not for what you produce for the family, which is quite a thing in, in, in those families. Okay? And you can say the same thing about Jacob as well. Okay? Um, so, so, so I think Elkanah is, is kind of the victim of, of what all husbands are, are guilty of, and that is you know, trying to help his wife rather than just listening. Okay, the, the, you know, he, he's, he's, he identifies her problem as you know, she hasn't come to terms with this, and he's trying to help her come to terms with it. And, and we see in this respect that, that Hannah, be, because she won't accept her fate, winds up being the winner. You know, that she, she doesn't just accept it, okay, I'm barren, I'll make, I'll make the best of it. Okay, she, she's determined not to come to terms to, uh, with it and, and praise and everything else. Um, now, how about, how about, the, how, how about uh, Pina, second wife? Is, is she... Um, what's your impression of her? Sounds like a typical second wife, jealous second wife. Uh, yeah, but look, we've we, we've we've seen second wives again in those previous situations. You know, there's there's Leah. But uh, some of them have um, uh, a, a position of power, and they're not jealous. She's jealous. She's not in a position of power. Well, even look, though she has the kids, she knows he loves Hannah more. Yeah. Well, look, uh, we. we in, in those other cases, again, every time there are two, two wives, which is Sarah and Hagal, and Rachel and Leah, the other woman, the, the fertile woman, is jealous of the love and the status of, of the barren woman, right? We're told that Hagar, once she started producing, once she produced a child for Abraham, she kind of... Um, uh, not despised, she made light of her mistress, of, of, of Sarah. Okay? She thought that I conquered, I, I took over the position of the first wife. Okay? She stopped showing respect to her mistress. And, and Leah, we know definitely, was jealous of Rachel for the love and the status that Rachel enjoyed in, in Jacob's heart and in Jacob's family. Okay, we, we saw this in, 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 the, in the names she gave her children. Okay, so you're right. So, so there is jealousy. You know, so the, the, the barren woman in, all these, in, in these three stories has a higher status. And the, and, and the fertile woman is, uh, I mean, it's definitely in the, in the case of Rachel and, and, uh, and Penina here, and, to, and, and maybe to a degree even, even Hagal, is... Um, is upset. Look, Pnina is definitely angry. Okay? She's bitter at Elkanah. Okay? The, the, she has given so much to her husband. You know, look at all these children. And, and you put me second? Okay? I gave you all this and you still don't love me. You love the other woman who gave you nothing. Okay, and we saw this with, with uh, Leah and Rachel. Okay, the, the, this, like I said, this story is a clear replay of the Leah and Rachel story. Okay. Both wives are heartbroken. Rachel is heartbroken and Leah is heartbroken. Hannah is anguished and Pina is anguished. Look, we, we, we kind of, of course, we, we read the story uh, from Hannah's perspective and Pina seems like a cruel woman. Um, but, but you can see the, the, the heartbreak. Where because we had the Rachel and Leah story, where we had the great sympathy for Leah, because Leah was more you know, kind of fleshed out by the storyteller, um, I, I think we're conditioned to... to s if, if we think of Pina's situation rather than just disliking the comment 
she made to uh, to Hannah, uh, we can see her. We, we can see Leah in her. Okay, she did what what she's supposed to do, and she is treated like a second class, like, like a second class wife, even though by all accounts she's the first class wife. She's not a failure. She's done all these things for her husband. She's given honor to her husband, and he does not honor her. He honors the other woman. Um, now, this is a small question, but uh, but it's it's made significant in the in in the commentary over over the centuries. The scene where Hannah prays to God. Um, this is verse. Oh. Verse ten. Yeah, but but uh, here, verse thirteen. Yeah, verse 13. And Hannah, so, so Hannah's praying to God um, and, and okay, uh, 12. You know, so she comes often to pray to God and Eli uh, is, is listening to, to, to hear what, he's, what, what she's saying and Hannah speaks uh, to her heart. I, I don't know how it's, uh, how, how does it translate it in English, David? So now Hannah was praying in her heart. Yeah, okay, praying in her heart. Um, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought her to be drunk. Okay, so why did Eli think that she was drunk? I mean, he's the high priest of many years. Why would he not recognize what she was doing as prayer? Okay, well, look, when, when you read about her prayer in verses 10 through 13 up till this point, um, does, does it explain why Eli would think that she's drunk? Her lips moved with no voice. Uh, she seems strange, not like she's in a state of prayer. And perhaps, I don't know, if she's uncontrollably unhappy, very unhappy. So, like, hysterical? I don't know if that's a well, good look, she's, word look, to put we, in. We're, we're told, look, she's not, um, she's not yelling, she's not crying. It says outright, yeah, she's there at the temple doing this. Look, it looks to us like... When, when you see, when you go to church uh, or, 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 when you see, or when you see somebody at the edge of their bed, uh, you know, crouching and, uh, and, and, and praying, this is what it looks like. Okay. Look, the, the, um, it seems, what she's doing seems like a normal prayer to us. Okay? Because modern people really do pray this way. But, but it's clear that, but apparently, uh, it did not seem like a normal prayer to, uh, to, to Eli, who's seen thousands of people praying. And so commentators have taken this one verse as an indication that apparently in those days, people prayed differently. Okay, so Hannah is said to be the first person in, in Jewish history to pray, to, to do what we call praying. And when you go backward and look at, at, at how people make entreaties to God, make requests to God, give thanks to God, etc., um, wh what you'll see is that nobody prays like this. Okay? Instead, what you see in previous, again, situations like this, asking God for stuff, uh, explaining, exclaiming support for God, exclaiming thanks to God, etc., what you come across is people crying out. The, the, the biblical author tells you that Joe Blow cried out to God, or Jim wailed to God, or Moses said to God, okay? or, or Iftach, making a public de declaration out loud in front of the people, uh, in, in front of God, in, 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 God's, in God's presence. Okay? But we don't ever come across a silent prayer up until now. 
Okay, so apparently... I always, I always thought he said that because she did it so much and so intensely. It was, it was a way to enhance the fact that she wanted this child so much and she prayed so much that he thought that she that he thought she was drunk. Well, but but again, it, it says that so she, it, it's so out, it's so extreme. Her wanting this child is so extreme because if you go back to verse um, ten, the marat nefesh v'kit kalel adonai u'chotiv ke. Yeah. She, she's yeah she's uh, she's bitter and she's praying to God and and she cried so yeah. I would think and, and this comes after it so I thought it's to make you understand how strange she is in the in what Elise sees every day because she wants this child so badly yeah yeah and look, and, and I think, but again, I, I, what, what's, uh, you're right. Okay. Um, but in, in the verse, in verse 13, or in 12, it says that Eli listens to hear what she says, but of course he can't hear what she says because she's not praying out loud. Okay. She's not verbalizing her, her prayer, her request. Okay. Um, so look, so... so Apparently, you're right about the crying. Okay, she's crying, but I'm assuming she's not the first person to cry. But apparently, it was a first for Eli, where the person doesn't verbalize their request or their whatever it is they're saying to God. And and then when he confronts her, and she, and, and when she explains her anguish, he can tell that that she's a woman of sincere and true faith, and and he gives her his blessing. Okay, which, of course, you know, look, look at verse uh, 7, uh, 18. Okay, the blessing, he gives her the blessing and it changes her mood completely. She goes back to her family, she regains her appetite, and the distress is lifted from her face. Um, now, so we, we have in Samson and in Samuel seemingly parallel stories back to back of a mother giving up her son to God but 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 the arrangements are are different okay? Samson is offered as a Nazarite meaning that he must remain pure and not cut his hair um, so he's he's offered okay so my son will be a Nazarite okay? but he's my son he'll grow up in my house Hannah vows not simply that the boy will be a Nazarite, okay? So, so the sacrifice that the boy will have to make. But, but that she will send him from her home to grow up in God's home. Okay, so, so here, uh, so, so in Hannah's story, in, in the parallel story of Hannah, uh, of, of Samuel, um, the boy will take on the vows of a Nazarite, just like Samson, but also there's a sacrifice that she imposes on herself. Okay, that this boy that I've been begging for, I'm aching for a boy, and I'm going to send him away. He's not going to live with me. Okay. Now, look, um, we've discussed this before that the Bible is not sentimental. Okay, you, you, what, what you have here in Hannah's story especially as it continues. Okay, it, it's already modeling. It's already kind of, it tugs at your heartstring, this barren woman being ridiculed at the dinner table, you know, the, 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 the anguish that she feels, and the husband wants to help her, but she's crying and she's, she's suffering every year with this scene at the, at the temple. Okay? Um, and, and this woman suffers and suffers, and she prays so hard for this boy for years. And then she gives him away at the age of three. When, you know, it says when, she wean, when, when, when the child is weaned, which is usually three years old. Um, so it's, it's a heart-rending, gut-wrenching scene you know, of, a, of, of this woman who gets 
the object of, of, of her prayers and then gives them away. Okay, so I think you can imagine what, what a modern novelist or a modern movie maker, even better, uh, would have squeezed this uh, squeezed out of this scene. Okay. Hannah would be sobbing as she packs for the trip. Uh, the boy, as she leaves him at the temple, uh, would be kind of crying, Mommy, Mommy, what are you, wh where are you going? Uh, Mommy, don't leave me. And Hannah would be walking away, tears down her face, camera pants to the boy, alone in the big temple, uh, just holding that coat that, that Mommy sewed for him. Okay. Scene, not a dry eye in the house. Um, but, but it's not the Bible's style. It's not the writing style. The, 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 the Bible is very laconic. Okay. So, so when you read this, how, how, do you, um, how does the Bible, how does this author convey this emotional load? Okay. How, how does the Bible convey Hannah's emotional state, her, her inner life, if it doesn't do this, these kind of, what I just described to you, this, the, the more obvious emotional descriptions. If you, if you, if you read, um, as you continue the, 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 the story, after the birth of this boy, towards the point where, where she says goodbye to him. This is a verse uh, yeah, 20 on. Yeah, to, to the end of the chapter, 20 to 28. What stands out to me is that she bowed low to the before the Lord. Th that she what? It was like uh, there was an emphasis as opposed on her grief uh, to her... Uh, relationship to the Lord. Right, but, but what I'm asking is, where, where, where do you see the... the so, so that's not... Uh, that, that's obviously sort of devotion or, or, or gratitude to God. But I'm asking, where, where do you see the... Again, the, the, the emotional state of this woman... Look, it's, it's a... Um, it's an emotional scene obviously. A woman who is aching for a child and then she gets this child and sends him away at the age of three. It's a baby. Okay. Uh, the so, 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 so again, the, 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 just saying, so the, the author is not an explicitly emotional writer. Okay? But where do you get in this story from verse 21 to uh, from 20 to 28 where do you get this emotion, the, the, again, the, the, the emotional input or, or the input about her emotional state? What are we saying, John? Oh, go ahead, Dave. She pleads out to the Lord. She says, please, my Lord, as I live, my Lord, I'm a woman who stood here beside you and prayed to the Lord. It is this boy I prayed for. Yeah, but look, and she, yes, yes. Lent, and she characterizes that lending him to the Lord. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, lending him from the Lord. I intend hereby lend him to. Oh, mine says to. Oh, that's insane. I cannot believe it. I in turn hereby lend him to the Lord. For as oh. long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. Okay, that's. That's, uh, that, that's, that's not good. That's, that's criminal. Uh, because look, e even the name, uh, wh where's this uh, verse where she names him? Uh, here, okay, how about verse 20 for you? Hannah conceived and at the turn of the year bore a son. She named him Samuel, meaning I asked the Lord for him. Okay, so uh, in Hebrew is because I borrowed him from the Lord. 
Okay. So the the uh, so like I told you uh, when we talked about Samson, that Samson's name is not explained. Usually, when we get a, a male character, uh, the the birth of a male character, there's an explanation of why he was named this way. Moses, because I pulled him out of the water. This, because of that. Um, so so here, uh, Shmuel, because Sha'alti, I, I borrowed him from God. Um, but <clears throat> um, the, the um, technically, if you, if you know Hebrew, it, it's, it's not strictly correct linguistically. But usually name explanations in the Bible just need to make sense phonetically to the ear rather than linguistically. Um, but, um, but okay, so, so look, so, so already the name, um, in, in terms of where, where you get this emotional uh, input about this woman's emotional state, about this woman who suffered for a son and waited for a miracle for years and years, uh, and now she knows that she'll have to give him away. Okay, so her name, I'm sorry, the name that she gives the child uh, already is, is, a, is, is a way for her to remind her that this boy is not staying with me. I just borrowed him. I borrowed him from God. Okay, so I don't know if you remember when we talk about Isaac. You know, God names Isaac. You know, and it's, and it's supposed to be a reminder to Moses and, and, and Sarah, you laughed when I told you that you're going to have a son. And every time you're going to call him, it'll be a reminder that you didn't believe. Okay, so the same thing here, that, that um, she names him borrowed son, borrowed child, to remind her he's going away. Okay. Um, the... Um, so, <clears throat> so uh, okay, and w what else, okay? So she names him. W where else do you get input about her emotional state or her, her inner state? Would, well, I would say, but it's in, it's in um, verse 19, which is before what you said. It's the fact that she made him a coat because usually in the Bible, you don't hear too many things about the clothes. What, what comes to my mind is... Um, the, the suit of many colors of um so they go to the length of telling you about how he made the suit for his favorite child and then you come to this story and again she made him a coat i think it's significant to the fact that she loved him that much and right. the, the author went to the you yeah. know but which, which which verse is it 19 19? No. No. Do you have, are you in chapter two maybe? Yeah, I'm in chapter two. Okay, no, yes. Yeah, so, no, I'm talking about, again, before she, before she gives the, the, ah. the, the boy away. Okay. In chapter Sorry. one. Okay, no, you, you're right about the code. The code is a big deal. We'll, we'll talk about the code. It's just that we're not there yet. Okay, so in chapter one, it, he's born, and then we're, uh, and then in, in, in he's born in uh, twenty. No, yeah, in twenty. And then she gives him away at twenty-eight, verse twenty-eight. Okay, so where in between? Uh, what, what other? Like I said, uh, I'm, I'm just. It's she not a. It's not. She doesn't want to go. She doesn't want to go to right. the. To the sacrifice. To, to the temple. Yeah, once once a year until he's three. Right. Right. After that, he'll be there forever. So uh, forever, right? So she doesn't go to the temple, um, which which is the place where she'll eventually have to desert this boy. Okay, so she names it. His name is a daily reminder to her that he's borrowed. And she's going to have to say goodbye to this boy of her dreams. And she doesn't go every year. The family goes to their annual sacrifice, and she doesn't join them 
um, you know, she, she I'm, I'm assuming, you know, she dreads the temple and she wants to stay at home with the boy until he's weaned. Okay? And only then, this is in, in verse uh, 22, okay, when she explained what explains why she's got what she's not going. Uh, because she tell she told her man, she told her Kana, um, that un until he's weaned, I won't take him up, and then and only then will I take him, and he'll see the face of God, and he will stay there forever. Is it, is that how it's read for you, David? Translated for you forever. Um, for you, period. Verse uh, He must remain there for good. Yeah, for good. Okay. Okay, so, so, so she, again, she, she explains to us, she explains to Elkanah and to us, why she's not going. Okay, I'm going to stay home with him before I have to bring him there where he'll be with the Lord and stay there forever. Underlined twice. Okay, so she stayed at home, again, verse 20, uh, 23, and nursed him until she weaned him, until he was weaned. So my, my point is, again, it's not important in terms of the, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's important in terms of the character construction. Okay? It, it's, because we're used to modern novels that kind of explicitly go into the emotional state of the, of the character, we might read this as just kind of, she did this and this and this and this and this, and we don't notice that actually it's a, it's a sweet um, this scene is sweet and full of emotion, but not in a, de in a demonstrative, demonstrative way. Okay? And then on top of that, and here we get to the coat, and then there's the business of the coat in, in, in uh, chapter 2, 18 and 19. Okay? And she made a little coat for him and brought it to him every time, every year, when they came to the temple to worship. Okay, so they come to the temple once a year to worship. And she made a little coat, and every year she brought him a coat. Okay. So, to Tal's point, you know, who cares about the coat? Why is the author bothered? The, the Bible is a pretty big book, and it's very terse. You know? Stuff that doesn't need to be in there isn't in there. Obviously, this coat is supposed to mean something. Okay, but wh why does the author bother us with the coat? Like, who, who cares? Who cares about the coat? Well, it's like I said about the coat of many colors. I think it's when it when something like this is referenced, it has a symbolic meaning of. And here it's even more extreme than the coat of many colors because it's a repetitive thing that she does right. every year. Right. It's, it's the repetition. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. She doesn't forget about him. It's not like you put a kid away in, you know, an institution and you forget about him. But he, she goes back every year and she brings him this sentimental sort of connection that she's hoping to keep with him through this coat that... You know, a lot of mothers do that. Right. They have this sentimental ritual that they try to have with their kids in order to sort of have this yeah. bond. Yeah. Look, the, the, like I said, the, this author is not sentimental ever. Okay? But it's not because the biblical author doesn't understand sentiment or psychology. Okay? He just conveys it uh, again, probably just the style of, of, of the, maybe the time or maybe just the, of, of this author. Um, he conveys it delicately rather than with a full orchestra of violins. Okay, so, so all the Bible says is that she visited him every year and that during that one year in between visits, she sews him a new coat every year to bring it to him on, on that annual visit. And then, like you said, she didn't forget her boy, even though she has five kids now. Look at uh, chapter 2, verses 20-21. 
Okay. Eli blessed Elkanah and, and, and his wife uh, and said, may, may God grant you uh, seed from this woman, from Hannah, for the loan, uh, you know, for, for, for the loan of her child. Um, and they returned to their home. And God blessed Hannah, and she conceived and bore three boys and two girls. Okay, so now she also has boys and girls, like Pnina. And Sam, so it, it, again, uh, 20, uh, verse 22, uh, sorry, 21. Okay, she had three boys and two girls, and Samuel grew up before the Lord, or grew up with the Lord. Okay, so she had these, a full house, but Samuel was away. Okay, so, so uh, it, it clarifies, I mean, the, this thing with the, with the coat, like, it's not, it's not about, this, uh, like, it's not, not about the nail. Uh, it's not about the coat. Okay, uh, the 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 coat. Through the coat, we see that even though she has a full house at home, this boy, and and even though this boy is is far away, alone in the temple with that old man Eli. Um, we know. Look, the the Bible doesn't tell us that she thinks that Hannah thinks of him every day and pines for him. But we know that every year there's a new coat, one size larger than last year's coat, woven and stitched by hand over the course of, of months. Okay, so look, she, this mother doesn't see her son grow. She doesn't feed him. She doesn't speak to him. She doesn't hug him. She doesn't deal with you know, when he's got a skin knee, all, all the things that mothers do. Her only contact with him during the year, is sewing the coat that he will wear next year. Okay. And the same is true of, of, of Samuel, and, and, and this we haven't read yet, but, but you'll see. Look, Samuel grows up without, without a mother. Yeah, well, he grows up without a mother, without a father, without brothers and sisters, without childhood friends, just an old priest and, and his crummy sons. In, the, in, in, in God's palace. Okay? The only contact he has with his family is the coat that he wears all year until next year's coat. Okay? So now, given the importance of the coat, I want you to jump ahead to chapter 15, verses 22, 15, 22 to 29. And David, if you could read the, uh, the English. I'd be grateful. Uh, but Samuel said, "Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices?" Uh, so, so, so this is the scene with, um, with. Uh, so, so there's a war. Uh, Samuel tells Saul, "Wait for me there. I'll come and, and offer the burnt the, the, the sacrifices to God." And, uh, and and he doesn't do it. Uh, Samuel doesn't arrive, and so Saul does it himself. Okay, so go ahead. As much in obedience to the Lord's command, surely obedience is better than sacrifice, compliance than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination, defiance like the iniquity of the teraphim, uh, because you rejected the Lord's command, he has rejected you as king. Saul said to Samuel, I did wrong to transgress the Lord's command and your instructions, but I was afraid of the troops, and I yielded to them. Please forgive me my offense, and come back with me, and I will bow low to the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not go back with you, for you have rejected the Lord's command, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Uh -huh. as, as Samuel turned to leave, Saul seized the corner of his robe and tore it. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has this day torn the kingship over Israel away from you and has given it to another who is worthier than you. Great. Um, so Samuel is um, Samuel is wearing a coat. Okay. Now read about Saul going to the sorceress. Also, we'll, we'll, we'll read this later. This is in uh, chapter 28. 28 verses 13 to 14. So I have uh, the king okay. answered her. So, 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 here, so, here's, uh, so he's already here at the sorceress, sorceress's place. Uh, 
and, 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 and by the way, so, so he goes there and he wants, so, so uh, Samuel is dead now, and Saul wants to consult before this big battle. He wants to, to consult with Samuel, so he goes to a sorceress to have her raise Samuel's um, uh, ghost from the dead. Okay? Go ahead. Uh, the king answered her, don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up from the earth. What does he look like? He asked her. It is an old man coming, she said, and he wrapped, or, and he is wrapped in a robe. Okay. And Saul it, it, knew it, that it was okay. Samuel. Yeah. So uh, in, in Hebrew it says, and he's wearing a coat. And, uh, and, and he's wearing a, he's an old man uh, wearing a coat. And thus Saul knew that it's indeed Samuel. Okay, so as soon as she says, an old man with a coat, Saul knows, okay, it's Samuel. Okay. So that coat, look, uh, the author brings that coat up. This is, you know, Samuel is an old man at that scene with, uh, with the sacrifice. He's a dead man in the scene with the, with the sorceress. Okay. Um, that that coat is clearly uh, Samuel's thing. Okay, kind of like if you if you think of um, of um, uh, Mark Twain's white suit. Okay, that's his shtick. Okay, and, and again, Saul doesn't see what what the sorceress sees, but when he hears "old man with a coat," he knows who it is. Okay, or or think of. Um, uh, Hulk Hogan's uh, yellow tank top. That's his uniform. Okay? So the, look, the, the Bible doesn't say anything overt about Samuel's psychology, but it makes sure that even the dimmest among us will get the connection between Samuel and his coat, and, and this coat. And then you start thinking about that coat. Okay, we get that every year, we, we read that every year, as he grew larger and larger, his mother brought him a newer and larger and larger coat that she had sewn throughout the preceding year. Okay, she's thinking of him as she sews it, and he's thinking of her as he wears it. Okay, because again, the, the coat is the evidence, is the only evidence that she can offer to him that she has not forgotten him. Okay, I know I have other boys and girls in the house. And I know I don't ever see you and don't do any of the motherly things, but I'm thinking of you. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I love you. I'm connected to you. Okay, that, that this is the evidence that she has, or, or this is the evidence that he has, that his mother hadn't given him away to this old man at the temple. You know, didn't toss him aside unwanted in favor of her other kids, her real kids. So again, the, the, the Bible never tells us, but we can easily imagine that when she died, we don't know when she died, but whenever she died, the last coat that she had sewn for him was the last coat he'll ever wear. Okay? The, the, and, and that, that's the coat he wears for years and years uh, until the day he dies and, and still after his death in, 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 the, in the netherworld. Okay? I'm, I'm assuming it's you know, worse for wear, ragged and torn and worn. Um, and look, Samuel, of course, can, can afford a, a new coat from the temple funds. But this is his mother's coat. You know, and, and, and the author, as we follow Samuel from birth to death, he's always with a coat, always. Okay. Um, and look, like, like, so the, the, we, we know that the biblical author rarely reveals the characters' inner lives through, uh, through words about their emotions or beliefs or doubts. Uh, usually the author shows it through the character's actions. Okay, like we talked about, you know, when, when, when God tells Abraham to, to sacrifice Isaac, we see this silent flurry of action uh, in response, okay, and it kind of paints a picture of, of, of turmoil in, in, in his heart. Or 
uh, Isaac asking those questions to his dad as they're going up the mountain, or Jacob's actions before meeting Esau. Okay, we, they could have just told us, and Jacob was very, very afraid that Esau would kill him. Okay? But he doesn't. We just see Jacob doing things that convey terror. Okay? Or think of the, of the heartbreaking names that Leah gives her different sons. Okay? We could, the, the author could tell us that Leah was really concerned, uh, was, was saddened by the fact that her husband doesn't love her and that her husband doesn't pay attention to her. Uh, and, and that he loves Rachel. Okay. All, uh, he doesn't. But we know this because she gives these terrible names to her sons like billboards for her anxiety and sadness and, and broken heart. Okay. So it's the same here. We're not, we're not told about Hannah's love and her ang- for, for Samuel and her anguish about the separation. And we're not told about Samuel's loneliness at the temple and his emotional isolation. Okay? But we're, we're guided to, to notice certain actions that shine a light on the character's emotional, uh, sign- uh, emotional state. Okay? So when King Saul inadvertently, you know, he, he's trying to stop Samuel from turning and walking away in front of a major battle. Okay? So when King Saul reaches for his coat and winds up tearing it inadvertently, we can easily understand Samuel's fury, you know, his, his fiery anger at Saul as, as, a, as, a personal, um, as, as personal anger rather than just the theological or political statement that, that uh, Samuel makes. Okay? Because, again, this is the, when he tears that coat. We, we remember that coat. That's that's that little coat that, that his mother brought every year. Um, holy crow! It's already three. <laughs> uh, tell you what. Um, Let's do this. So I, uh, I, I was going to devote the uh, remainder of, of, of today to discussing, discussing Samuel's great speech on, on the king's rule or the king's habit um, in order to investigate a pretty big question about whether God knows the future. Because uh, as I said, Samuel makes a prediction about what, what your king will do if you guys get, get your wish. If you, if you guys get a king, what that will look like. And it proves to be correct. If you read on about the rule of Saul, David, and Solomon, and then on in the book of Kings about the, the kings to follow, um, it comes true. So it's, um, you know, we, we, we talked in the past about this question about whether God is all-powerful. And a related but not the same question is whether God knows the future. And I think if we get into this now, it's going to be a very long session. So I suggest we put a lid on this here and discuss just this one issue next time. Okay. Okay? Mm-hmm. That way we don't... Uh, Stay here forever. All right. So, um, yeah. So for next time, yeah. Just to, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I tell you what. J- just just read that speech uh, okay. again for next time. Okay. Sounds good. And, um, yeah. And uh, see you next week. Okay. Any, any yes. other issues or questions or? All right. Well. Till next time. Next time. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.